Um, I'd like to welcome Will. Um, Will is the uh, co-director of the Mid Klamath Watershed Council. And um, he uh, was uh, recommended by, um, uh, uh, I was having a conversation with Mark Tuckman and um, uh, was asking him about uh, folks who are um, really uh, invested in the use of information data in um, bringing groups together to make decisions, make tough choices and tough, tough judgments around um, priorities for preventing wild, uh, severe uh, wildfire. And uh, Will was at the top of his list. He said, you know, um, really what Will and his team and their coalition are doing is um, a model really for the rest of the state. And so we've asked Will to come today and um, give us a taste of, of not only their initiative, but um, how in particular, how data sort of played a, a key role. So Will, just wanna thank you and um, hand it over to you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I am lucky enough to spend my time between the most rural part of California on the Klamath River, in fact, the Salmon River in far Northwest California. And then a third of the school year, I'm down here in Alameda with my kids uh, who are, are with my, my ex, who's the archivist for the San Francisco Symphony after she got tired of living in nowhere for 20 something years. So I, I'm lucky enough to get a taste of both worlds, but um, I've spent my entire life uh, working with indigenous uh, communities in the Klamath Mountains to restore fire process. And, um, you know, I apologize to folks that are looking for straight data today. You know, I'm a storyteller. I work with a lot of incredible scientists and I'll be speaking some about their work and I'd be happy to connect, to connect you with them. But I think, you know, my goal today is to just help ground the work that you do in the fire reality that we're facing today and give you some tools and ideas to think about how data uh, specialists can help uh, be part of that team that helps solve our, our fire problem. Um, so to um, expedite this, you know, my talk is going to be a whirlwind since I have a ton of slides and not a lot of time. Uh, and so I'm just going to jump right in. And uh, Tom, please give me the hook if I'm going too long or give me a five minute warning because I know uh, we want to have some time for uh, uh, conversations. Will do. Thank you. So yeah, this is, this is a, a peek into my world here, using data to support the restoration of fire processes in the Klamath Mountains. Uh, I am lucky to work with an incredible group of native and non-native folks uh, who call that place home. The Mid-Klamath Watershed Council over the last 20 years has grown from me and this other hippie in my guest bedroom to over 70 employees and a 4 million plus annual budget uh, restoring in-stream and, and upslope environments. And really, you know, we're, we're engaged in the communities. We all live in the communities we serve. Um, and, and we're, you know, looking at, um, you know, both economic, ecological, and social growth all, all together. And I think that's critical for success in, in the long term. Uh, my, my dad came to the area hunting for Bigfoot in 1969. My mom came to the local hippie commune. That's, that's me sitting on my dad's lap there. You can see his left leg is just broke from a, a logging accident when a, he got a log rolled over him. And, and he missed uh, making a bunch of money on the 1977 hog fire that burned right behind this, the cabin that we're sitting out front, the, the cabin that I was born in. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to grow up with a bunch of Native friends like Holly Hincher here, who's a, a social worker for the Kuduk tribe, and, and to have gained some knowledge uh, from our, our tribal friends. You know, my mom threw me in a, in a burden basket, a Native burden basket when I was a kid, and perhaps, you know, sitting there tied up and having to look at things a little bit gave me a different perspective on life. Um, of course, my brother went the other way. He became one of the preeminent timber fallers in Northern California and has done it his whole life. There was a three-year period where we didn't speak to each other, you know, because I was certain that he was ruining everything I loved. 
you know, he ended up breaking his leg and, and told me to go into something else besides logging. You know, my dad was a logger. He was a logger. And uh, I ended up going into fisheries and, and then uh, and then ultimately fire ecology. You know, um, the fisheries of the Klamath Mountains are incredible. And, and I've been lucky enough to do a lot of videography, a, a form of, you know, fish pornography uh, from sturgeon to steelhead to salmon. Um, but you know, as we watched our spring Chinook salmon runs decline, the last wild runs in California, you know, I realized that um, if we didn't solve our fire problem, we were going to lose our fish, you know, and, and, and the really what fires are doing to our landscapes in California require, you know, it's an all hands on deck moment. You know, we have this incredible diversity across the state. Um, and that diversity, like in our area, we have the highest conifer diversity in the world. Um, and when you look into it, that diversity is because of the pyrodiversity on our landscapes. These are fire dependent ecosystems. You know, here we have uh, uh, Brewer spruce on the left of this picture that was literally rubbing branches with a knob cone pine, which is on the right side of this picture. So you've got the Brewer spruce is one of the, the largest fire avoiding species that's this touching a, a knob cone pine, which is a fire obligate, meaning it needs fire for its cones to open and set seed. And so you have these in completely polar opposite fire regimes cutting on a knife edge in places like Soames Peak, where, where I uh, came upon these two trees. In the background, you see the Trinity Alps and glaciers that are uh, waning for the first time since the last ice age and almost going away. Uh, and that water was what, um, you know, supported our spring salmon runs. And, and they're being intercepted by what you see on that middle ridge, which is even age conifer forests that have grown up like weeds in our open spaces through fire exclusion, a century of fire exclusion. And so a lot of the diversity that we once had in our ecosystems where south facing slopes were relatively bare uh, and north facing slopes had broken canopies where the snow could fall and, and, you know, preserve and shade that snow to be released through the year. You know, they've converted to, to even age stands that fire can just race up and over mountains through large landscapes. And this wasn't by accident. You know, the first uh, regional forester in California knew that they were embarking on this, uh, as he said, uh, what is it? Um, uh, uh, the uh, uh it's not this is a different quote but this is talking about what he was saying about you know making a forest of the future as in the protection of the present mature chance and it intends to make sure the future timber crop like any other crop is as heavy or as complete as can be secured and so you know the intent was was purposeful to remove fire from california landscapes so that they would fill in with with um you know timber trees and, and the forests that folks like Wieslander who mapped the vegetation in the 30s in our area saw in these pictures, you know, were, were already changing uh, in the early ages of fire exclusion. You see these young Douglas fir coming up in, in a black oak stand near Orleans. You know, places where elders used to gather like red cap glade on the left here are completely disappeared in the past 60, 70 years. Uh, habitats that that produced an incredible amount of, of food and, and uh, fiber resources have converted to a single resource, which is, you know, conifers. But there's clues that point to how fire used to run across this landscape, like this 1931 map from the Hoopa Reservation that shows ignition sources that they were putting out by this time. But you can see these polygons on this map follow trail systems, they follow, uh, you know, those red polygons of the fires, you know, they're, they're literally patch burning one burn into the previous season's burn using recent fire footprints to stop uh, the, the fires and manage the, the resources across the landscape. Uh, a lot of this knowledge from women like Nettie Rubin uh, and, and Sandy Bar Bob is passed down through the ages that genocide wasn't complete in our area. And so there's still tribal folks alive today. In fact, I know some of these, these folks' relatives 
and that that knowledge is essential for maintaining Kaduk culture. You know the the food and fiber and medicine and ceremonial resources that you know created some of the most sophisticated sophisticated basketry in the world and some of the highest diversities of food from salmon to elk uh, to huckleberries and, and acorns. You know, that landscape has been highly departed because of fire exclusion. You know, these were food forests that were managed over millions of acres with um, intentional fire. And in the past hundred years, what we've seen is, you know, us white folks have literally tried to bomb fire out of this landscape, you know, starting in the 50s, we were using borate bombers. Before that, they were hiring native people to put out lightning fires whenever they sprouted up. And, you know, they conducted industrial timber management um, in some of the steepest country in the state for decades. And a lot of that fuel was left on the landscape. And in my childhood is when uh, that chicken came home to roost, you know, the, the climate change from one of the wettest centuries on record to one of the driest centuries on record. And we started to see the rise of mega fires uh, that, you know, burned down uh, my friend's home several times. Our home came close to burning down many times. And the landscapes like that picture of Yellow Jacket Ridge on the right, which you know, my house is right down at the bottom of this drainage, you know, the, the salmon were going belly up in the streams because of streams full of sediment, um, you know, and, and the reality that we're facing on the landscape, I think can best be characterized. And I encourage all of you to make this map for your home landscape. It's a, it's a map of fire overlaps. And what it shows is how many times has fire been to a certain place since we've been keeping fire records for the past century or so. And uh, like Carl Skinner, uh, a wonderful uh, retired geographer from the Pacific Southwest Research Station said, you know, there's more fuel on the landscape now than there ever has been since the last ice age. There's never been a time that we've seen so little fire on this landscape. Uh, and, and you can see from, from this area where we're at in North, Northwest California along the Klamath River, all that pinkish purple color hasn't seen any fire in, in the past hundred plus years. Now the reality is that those areas are now burning pretty much every summer. I can say in the past three years since we made this map, most of the pink you're looking at here has seen high severity wildfire. So this gives you a clue about where that next fire is gonna happen. But also it gives you the clue about where there's been the most fire overlaps and where there's opportunities for using frequent fire, um, you know, to, re, to, to continue those uh, uh, forests on a pathway towards resilience. And the other thing that this map, you know, we use this map for is to show you know, only recent fire footprints are stopping a lot of the fires that, that we see. Um, you know, we know from the fire severity records that first started getting kept in 1984 that, you know, the size and the severity of these fires are increasing. Um, and, and that, you know, like I said, only the recent fire footprints are, are stopping uh, these fires. Like in this top uh, 2014 Happy Camp complex fire, you can see where it articulates with um, that red blob kind of to the lower left. You know, that's the 2008 Panther fire. And, and when it burned into that fire footprint, it just literally went to the ground and stopped. It went out. Um, so, you know, that pattern of fire on fire interactions is critical towards understanding fire on the landscape today. Now, the fire behavior we're seeing is, is like nothing else in the historic record. You know, these are some 400 foot flame links coming up from the Whites fire before it made. And that was that I took that picture the day before I took this picture when it made an 11,000 acre high severity run up Tanner's Peak and created a 40,000 foot pyrocumulonimbus cloud that spread lightning fires 70 miles to the north in into Oregon. Um, and you know that that this is just a map of, of severity on that day that the fire made the huge run. And it started several other, other large fires, one right around, right next to the town in the town of Happy Camp that burned another 140,000 acres at high severity. 
and we look at where these, these, these high severity burns are happening, you can go back to that fire overlaps map and it's coming from areas where there's been no fire, no recent fire history in the past you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 years. And the effects are devastating to watersheds and, and streams. Uh, you know, following the 2014 Whites Fire, we had a midsummer thunderstorm that literally converted uh, 20 miles of a high quality coho stream, Greider Creek, into uh, literally a drainage ditch with a, with a bunch of mud. Um, and, you know, with these threatened species, we just don't have time to lose, you know, large streams like that every, every year. This is what I saw in 2020 rolling into the town of Happy Camp on Black Tuesday. The Slater fire ended up burning uh, approximately uh, 120,000 acres that day in one burn period. Uh, it was a fire scar that was 30 miles long by nine miles wide. It burned down over 200, over, over 200 homes. We lost three people that day. Um, you know, it had 50 mile an hour winds with 3% humidity. There was no way us humans could really do anything to stop this fire. You know, the only thing that stopped it was uh, two recent wildfire footprints to the west. Um, and a friend of mine, Lee Tarnay, modeled that fire and said if it wasn't for those recent fire footprints, the oak and the Natchez, that fire would have burned 50 miles to the ocean and burned down the town of Crescent City in, in one day. Um, you know, what we saw on the ground was traditional firefighting tactics didn't work. All we could do was just barely nudge that fire a little bit to the side to, to save homes. Um, and luckily, after 24 hours sustained winds, it died down. Several of our board members at Mickwick lost their homes, including Dean Davis. We had three board members lost their homes, but Dean had poured his whole life into this mid-slope castle uh, you know, and, and the realities that people are facing in these environments, you know, just watching their whole lives go up in smoke. Dean actually tried to stay and defend and ended up in a small three acre prescribed burn that we had done in his car with the, you know, the uh, air conditioner on as he watched his house burn and his llama catch fire outside of his car sitting right be beside him. Um, just so much trauma and loss. Um, you know, one of the interesting things was that while the, the um, Slater fire was burning, the Red Salmon fire also was burning and, and it, uh, you know, bumped into the 2013 Butler fire, which was seven years earlier and went out even in high fire conditions, but burned through uh, the older Megram fire footprint to the south. Um, so the reality, you know, on our landscape is that we're just maximizing the negative impacts of fire with current fire suppression practices. You know, the Forest Service touts that 98% of all the fires are, are put out, but the reality is the 2% that escape burn at the hottest, dry, driest times of year and, and uh, causes greater risk to firefighters and communities. You know, in the past 10 years, we've uh, seen over 500,000 acres burned there's been over $550 million spent on suppression. And we don't have anything to show for it except for a bunch of burned out towns and watersheds. You know, that it just kills me that with all these impacts, there's never been any environmental analysis of the effects of fire suppression. You know, it's still treated as a natural event in the eyes of, of our environmental regulatory agencies. So I'm, I'm challenging all of you smart people on this call to help us hold fire suppression accountable. I know we all wanna save our homes, but the reality is we need to um, think a little bit differently and you know, build this social and cultural movement to change how we're managing fire at the landscape scale. You know, Bill, just real quick, um, about five more minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna skip ahead to the part you guys wanna hear about, but these are a bunch of really cool programs that got us there. Uh, the community liaison program, I heard you talking about, you know, getting data to wildfire events. That's the way that we package our uh, local data and have a, a formal relationship with incident management teams to get them that data. But, you know, all this is building the foundation to, uh, 
you know, to, to engage with the state and federal fire agencies. We were involved in some hard uh, 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 collaborations with the Forest Service, like OCFR project here. And, you know, finally we started rebuilding again through the Western Klamath Restoration Partnership in 2013. Um, I'm just gonna skip through, you know, basically we spent a lot of time on, you know, what we had in common. We've been fighting each other for 20 years but we came through the open standards process um, with the Nature Conservancy's facilitation, you know, to these six shared values, sustainable local economies, cultural and community vitality, fire adapted communities, restored fire regimes, and resilient biodiverse forests, plants, animals, and fish, and, and a healthy river system. And, you know, that, that journey basically allowed, you know, environmentalists and loggers preachers, tribal members, state and federal fire agencies to really start to work together. Um, and, but the key was when, uh, you know, we started, you know, not just, you know, kind of going from, you know, blockades to ribbon cutting events, but when we started to overlay our shared values spatially, and we created this overlay assessment layer for our entire 1.2 million acre landscape that, that basically were all the values, the things that we wanted to see, uh, and all the you know from protecting houses to protecting our critical access egress routes to elk habitat to um, you know mid mature dense fur stands uh, to you know prime uh, habitat for threatened and endangered species, uh, and and that created that map you see in the background, which is you know basically the more layers that overlaid started to call those places out where we all agreed we needed to do work. And so this is an incredible way to get uh, agreement on where to spend money first, where to do work first based on, on shared values. And for us that, you know, we created this manual weighted system of these various layers that you see here um, for manical, manual, mechanical and, and prescribed burn treatments. Um, and, and I can provide this all later, you know, for lack of time, but, um, you know, this was an incredible uh, process uh, that we went through, and I summarized it here in, in this um, collaboration with the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network. We kind of made this two-page brochure that, that speaks about how, you know, folks came together to, to create this overlay assessment. Um, and that went into our first pilot project, uh, which was the, the SOMES project, which um, you know, I can't go into right now, but I, I encourage folks to look it up online and read our 300 page environmental assessment uh, because you know, what, I think what we did that hadn't been done before was we fully analyzed the no action alternative, you know, because the no action alternative is the continued fire exclusion alternative which in our case is what was causing the risk um, and combining traditional, traditional knowledge uh, with um, the best available Western science to move away from single species management. Um, I'm, I did some stuff on prescribed burning here, but really I'm just gonna go straight to, uh, you know, the, the stuff that I think you guys are more concerned about, which is um, modeling. These two layers, uh, the efforts, the, the reburn simulation work that we've been involved with, with Paul Hesberg from the Pacific Northwest Research Station, uh, Susan Pritchard from the University of Washington, and uh, Sky Greenler, a grad student at Oregon State, is, I think, critical for all landscapes in California. And basically what that process is, is creating state and transition models that show what types of vegetation move to what other types of vegetations with various types of disturbance and primarily, you know, various severity wildfire or wind throw events or snow down events. Um, but it allows us to see how fire moves on a landscape over thousands of years and to get a picture of what the historic vegetation was before we started suppressing fires. Uh, and then it also gives us an idea of, you know, what fire, what our treatments will do to that vegetation uh, so we can look at you know whether or not those treatments are are going to be successful in the long run 
And that ties in with the, the pods work that we're actually doing with Mark Tuckman and um, Christopher Dunn from Oregon State University, which, um, you know, basically looks at, you know, when and where managed wildfire might be an option, but also what, what is that, um, you know, that network of fuel breaks that we can build on the landscape to help us manage wildfires with more nuanced decision making, you know. Like for instance, we had a, a lightning bust mid-May this last year, and all those wildfires were put out. But the reality is, you know, we were doing prescribed burning all the way up to early July, and some of those wildfires could have been managed to larger boxes to get those recent fire footprints on the ground for the wildfires that came later in the year. You know, like we saw with the Slater fire, they're effective at, at stopping the burns. And so Pods isn't anything new. The Forest Service first started developing them in the Sierras probably eight or nine years ago. But what's new is doing them in a in a, a collaborative framework with multiple partners because um, your your fire managers aren't going to make that decision to manage wildfires for resource objectives until they know there's buy-in with the communities that are affected by those decisions. Um, so this is the example of our collaboratively developed pods for, for the Klamath Mountains. And those basically include, you know, the uh, potential control lines layer, which looks at, you know, the probability of success with containment. It looks at suppression difficulty index, which is, you know, you know basically points out where you have a chance of stopping wildfires uh, on the landscape and what the fields are doing. And then it looks at a qualitative risk assessment of you know, those highly valued resources and assets and, and starts to point you where you know, wildfire could be a good thing in one area at a certain time of year, or it could be damaging at another time of year. Now, the, the reburn models are quite a bit more complex. Um, this work has been published on by Pritchard and Hesberg in several papers from uh, Eastern Washington, Northeastern uh, Oregon and Idaho from the tripod fire, uh, East Zone fire and, and others, the Kootenai. But basically they were able to make these state and transition pathways for every vegetation type by running these 3000 year simulations of, of FSIM programs to grow out vegetation over time in these various management scenarios from full suppression to partial suppression to no suppression. And the interesting thing is that what they came up with really um, corroborated the, the ethnographic studies from our area in regards to the forest that native people described before contact. Um, and, and it also lined up with Anderson and Barber's 2002 paper that was developed through um, anthro, uh, you know, anthropological sources uh, and, and so their models were basically spitting out these forests these that were formed by both lightning and, and indigenous burning, you know, large trees that were well spaced with um, grass and, and uh, herbaceous understories uh, that were carried frequent fire over time. Now in the Klamath Mountains, we're, we're expanding this reburn work with Sky Greenler um, to add cultural ignitions uh, to the lightning ignitions over time to show what humans interacting with fire on landscapes for thousands of years can do to vegetation. Um, so that's um, her, her uh, doctoral work will likely be published in the next year. And she made these couple slides that really kind of spoke to you know, the reality, which is indigenous communities have been stewarding these fire prone landscapes for millennia. And we really need to understand what, you know, Nettie Rubin and Sandy Barr Bob knew when they were practicing fire in order to restore um, these fire dependent landscapes to their historic productivity. Um, so yeah, we're, we got a ton of money in the past few years. We got $20 million from CAL FIRE. We just got a collaborative forest landscape restoration program grant for $40 million over the next 10 years uh, to um, you know, start doing fuels reduction at the scale that we need to. Um, you know, one of the things I'm most excited about is um, restoring the ceremony of the use of fire on Offield Mountain 
uh, the last time that ceremony was held in 1917 at the new moon in September. Uh, at the end of the world renewal ceremonies, uh, the Kudduk people would put fire on the top of Offield Mountain and it would burn out to the landscape. Um, but it's been outlawed uh, for over 100 years. So uh, we're really excited about that. Um, got a bunch of other big projects going, um, but I know we're short on time. You know, one last thing I'll say, you guys are very lucky to have Sasha Berlin working down here on your landscape. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to, to burn with her, but um, you know, she's one of my collaborators. Uh, and this was a great burn we did not so long ago up at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, uh, where I got my two kids out there burning with her niece and one of my friend's kids. Uh, and it's just so powerful to see our, our young kids taking fire into their own hands and, and learning those skills again. So um, yeah, with that, I'll end it. And thanks for your time. <laughs> Excellent. A virtual round of applause. Will, thank you so much. Um, wow, there's a lot in there, um, uh, and we're going to open it up for for uh, questions in just a second. But I just want to um, acknowledge just the scope of what you just covered. Um, the uh, um, this is a tremendously personal endeavor of yours, and um, thank you so much for sharing your very personal connection. Um, and, you know, ending with that personal connection as well. It's wonderful to see your kids and, and Sasha's niece out there. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, and your comment about um, no, um, you know, uh, serious data. Um, uh, there was plenty of serious data in there. And I, um, I can, you know, already hear in our audiences, um, you know, heads, what, where, where did that data come from? And how, how did you establish these collaboratives with these academics who are seem like they're pushing the envelope on reaching not only back into the historical uh, record, but also, you know, having for, you know, forward looking models that are trained to on the ground knowledge. It's all incredibly fascinating. Just a couple of um, kind of housekeeping things. Um, first, um, uh, as well, as we talked about, we're going to post this your presentation as a video um, on our YouTube channel. So that's one way to share what we just um, were um, uh, um, sort of uh, graced with there, um, your message. And the other thing is, as I'm sure some of this, your graphics are so compelling. Um, I'm just wondering if, if uh, I'm sure this would be a question that folks would have if you're willing to um, share your slide deck in some form. Um, that would be really tremendous um, for Absolutely. us. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, you know, and, and one thing I meant to, to touch on was that the whole investment in that state and transition reburn model, and, and I think it needs to be done statewide, is, is that if, if people don't have a shared vision for what they're managing forests towards, then they end up just fighting over everything all the time, you know, and so it's so critical for us to have some baseline of, of what those you know, functioning e ecosystems look like um, you know, so that we have an idea what we're managing towards, not to say it's gonna be the same as what it once was because of all the impacts, but um, you know, there's a huge opportunity here to you know, use science uh, you know, in, infused with traditional knowledge to help paint a much clearer picture than what we have today. Thank you for that. Um, I have a few questions, but I, let's let's hear from um, from folks. Please um, feel free to take yourselves off mute and ask away. I'll shoot one in. Um, your map of the extent of your area that burned has burned over the past few decades um, really reminded me of what the North Bay looks like now in terms of fire perimeters, bumping up to each other, crossing each other, filling in all the gaps. And, um, you know, you live in a, in a relatively unpopulated area and we don't have that luxury in the Bay Area, you know? So, so just thinking about how would you implement a landscape scale, you know, 
um, burning program um, within such a populated area? Yeah, that that's a great question, and and I don't interview, uh, I don't uh, envy folks like Dennis Rain and Sasha who are, are burning down here in the Bay. But you know, we did get some funding through the North Coast Resource Partnership, and and we're actually um, doing pods layers for an eleven county area all the way from uh, Sonoma up to Del Norte and Siskiyou, and so it does include like communities like Santa Rosa, um, and there is an application, I believe, uh, with that pods layer as you start to break down you know these larger kind of landscape scale pods and the less populated landscape but as you come into the wooey in the front country that starts to look much smaller so you go from say a five to ten thousand acre pod to something that looks more like you know 500 to a thousand acres uh, or, or even smaller based on topographic features property ownerships or wherever you could theoretically strategically pull off you know, larger scale prescribed fire, which is the direction we're going in. And then at some point you identify that line where you think, you know, managed wildfires are gonna, or wildfires that aren't managed, you know, that are just there and you have to deal with them are interacting with that treated landscape. And so that's where, you know, working with your communities, it was so powerful at our first pods workshop at the Pepperwood Preserve um, you know, to hear folks uh, from the local fire safe councils for the first time kind of getting this more landscape scale picture and talking with CAL FIRE and the Forest Service and Tuckman and others about, you know, how their efforts to make defensible space interact with, you know, CAL FIRE's efforts to do some burning with the larger landowners and then with, you know, the larger landscape of Forest Service land ownership. So, um, you know, there's application there, how it plays out in the long run is still, you know, to be seen, you know, there's, a, you know, basically you have to build the, the social license to use fire at, at a larger scale, which, which means, you know, producing smoke that impacts people with smoke issues, um, you know, and, and managing that smoke so that um, you're not really hurting people like, like they could be, it means um, dealing with liability issues from burning across boundaries, um, which you know we've we've been able to deal with that on our landscape, like you say, because some of the very you know instead of fifty partners, maybe it's fifteen, and and that makes it uh, tractable. Um, so you bring up a good issue, but I do think that both those models, the reburn model. Uh, the pods model and the overlay assessment model, which isn't necessarily having to do with, you know, large, large scale prescribed burning or anything. It just shows that where people's different values overlap on the landscape so that you can start to prioritize where, where that funding is being spent. Thank you, Will. Other questions? Oh, well, um, I have a question for you. The, um, the state in transition um, work. So um, uh, do I have it correct that um, that product um, kind of tells you uh, how a any given patch on the landscape is sort of where it is on a, um, I mean, I guess you could think of it as sort of a demographic curve, like where, where is it? Um, uh, you know, uh, on its way to some other state. Uh, is that is that kind of how that works? Yeah, I mean, the power is that um, it's it's taking like individual species and growing them out over time. And so, like you know, in in a, a, a modeled environment, um, you know. So basically, yeah, you you it needs a supercomputer. Uh, Susan Pritchard has been you know, running these models at the University of Washington. Um, and, and it basically is just growing out vegetation based on known parameters, um, slope aspect, elevation, soil type, all factor into that. And then you're, you're, you know, you're shifting the frequency and the type of fire that's being delivered to those stands. 
And so what the state and transition models do is they say, well, if you have a, you know, an, an open pine stand with, uh, you know, an oak understory that receives a, a moderate severity fire, you know, you're going to lose 10% of your overstory trees and 30% of your understory trees in that fire. And then it keeps track of that for that patch of ground. Whereas, in, and so it's keeping track of every place within your modeled landscape over, over time. And then each new successive fire event, you know, changes the stand by, you know, whether it's low, moderate severity or extreme fire behavior, um, it, it affects, you know, and sometimes it, you know, will reset the, the stand back to ground zero with a bunch of dead logs on the ground that ultimately fall down and, and, you know, concentrate that heat on the ground. And then when that burns, you know, you get soil erosion, which decreases the productivity of that site. And you get, sometimes you'll get type level change from, you know, a forested environment to a shrub environment or, or a grass environment. Um, so the, the power in that model is that, you know, it, it really, in the places where they've been able to dial it in, uh, in those landscapes to the north, it's, um, you know, it, it is corroborated by when they go out on the landscape and they look at places that have had frequent fire returns or, or similar fire return intervals, that it, it stacks up with the model. And so if we can build that for landscapes in California, it gives us an ability to say, you know, how, what, what treatments will best sequester above ground carbon? You know, what treatments will best um, mitigate smoke outputs? What treatments will, you know, start to, um, you know, support habitat for threatened and endangered species that are being impacted by fire exclusion over time? Uh, so, you know, it helps to get at these bigger questions. And, you know, what did those historic forests look like that were in that frequent fire environment? Um, and because, you know, it's, so highly departed folks like me can't even begin to conceptualize without the help of folks that have been, you know, without historic records or without models to help us. You touched on a, uh, several points there, but one, one that I would underscore is this idea of a departure from some condition. And so many themes that you raised um, kind of are interwoven here, the idea that you need to know what you're managing toward and that um, it's a smart thing to do to look um, in the past um, for guidance for that. And then these models, the, the utility of these models is to, uh, what I'm hearing is to show you two things. It sounds like one, how departed are you from that condition that was perhaps more sustainable and resilient. And then also um, what's the appropriate pathway. So being able to, look at those trade-offs um and well first is that is that roughly kind of uh, hearing that correct and yeah I, you know i i think that it's it, there's even more uses in the sense that mm -hmm. um you know there's a lot of proposed projects right now with cal fire and other state agencies throwing money at the fire problem you know, but but the reality is, you know, are all these treatments, you know, where is the most effective place to spend this money? Mm -hmm. And and I think that's where the the reburn model, like for instance, it complements the pods model because the pods can say, hey, here's your biggest, you know, potential control locations. Mm -hmm. um, but what kind of treatments do you need to make those potential control locations actually function during a wider range of conditions of fire weather? And so you can model through reburn um, and the, the, you know, the fire and vegetation simulations, you know, how you can basically run fires across the landscape and see how they interact with these fuel breaks or, or um, you know, different um, uh, strategic um, thinnings on the landscape. And then, you know, you can say, well, that, that thinning needs to be 10 times as big in order to be effective or it's not going to work, you know, so it's, mm -hmm. it's a way to analyze and then it and then it allows you to make kind of real world decisions instead of, you know, because I think we're just in this reactive phase right now yeah. with fire in California, and we really need to get past that to a more objective way of prioritizing 
when and where and why we're doing work at the landscape scale. Thank you. I know we're coming up on time, but I've got one more question for you. Um, on, uh, the idea that um, you know this is something that should be done statewide, you've mentioned a couple of times, um, on the chance that the state is unable to perform this kind of modeling statewide and that subregions are going to need to, as you all have, sort of um, link arms and get it done themselves. Um, what, um, the top question on my mind is what are we missing? Are we collecting the right data as a region? And um, there's a lot of investment into foundational data sets right now. And um, I'm really curious to sort of see um, like a list of all the inputs that you all had to, you know, over the yeah. years had to somehow collate. Yeah. Um, and where's the gap here in the Bay Area as we're kind of coming around the whole Bay and collecting these foundational data sets? It's probably a more complex question to answer in the next final minutes, but what are your top level thoughts? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's interesting how diverse the landscapes of California are. I mean, you don't necessarily have a legacy forest in a lot of places down here, you know, because it was open space, it was grassland. And so it's not like, you know, a lot of what we're relying on is fire history studies, uh, dendrochronology studies, lake core sediments uh, that, that show shifting vegetation patterns over time in relation to climate. Um, so there's been a lot of work up in the Klamath Mountains, and, and we're basically getting grad students to come in and fill in those pieces where we don't have data, in particular in regards to fire history and, and response of vegetation to known fires so that we can calibrate the model. In a landscape like this, I don't have the, the knowledge and the history to, to advise you except to say that, you know, you need to find those um, scientists that that have done that work and and that you know paint the clearest picture of what transformations these landscapes have gone through um, and then incorporate cultural knowledge and in, into that you know because in so many places we act like you know all, all the native people are gone and we just know that isn't true you know there those people are there I mean I've, I've talked with several members of the Amamutsun tribe um, in my short time down here, and and um, you know, while while that knowledge has been impacted, it still needs to be kind of informing, you know, the the science that we're bringing to it. So you know, combining the best available Western science with the best available cultural knowledge, and in in our case, it means you know, bringing the Amamutsun folks up to burn with the Karuk, who have more of that traditional fire knowledge because a lot of it is that philosophy and thinking applies to many different landscapes. It's not necessarily just about what plants you're burning, but it, it's how you burn it and why you burn it um, that's important. 